At the center of every armed conflict of the 20th century, the machine gun has been a tool of conquest and of liberation. Everywhere, it has unleashed consequences its creators never imagined. This is the story of one of the world's deadliest inventions. The story of technological innovation, of industrial revolution, and political power. In 1999, Kosovo, NATO A-10 warthogs attack Serb targets. They use a multi-barreled revolving machine gun. Firing depleted uranium core bullets at the phenomenal rate of 4,000 a minute, the high-tech General Electric minigun can shred concrete, armor, and people with ease. And it was invented more than 100 years ago. By 1840, the Gatling Cotton Plantation in North Carolina has become a confining place for young Richard Jordan Gatling. When only 17, Gatling had invented the first ship's propeller. But stuck in the rural south, he was beaten to the patent office in Washington. If Gatling wants to be an inventor, he has to leave the south and head north. A person like Gatling would just be instinctively drawn to the north because that's where the action was. Everything mechanical seemed to come from the north. It was one of the causes of the Civil War. The south was perfectly happy being its agrarian self. Whereas the north was becoming more and more powerful, and it was the Big Apple. It's where you had to go to make your dreams come true. In this new wave of industrial revolution, no country is growing faster than the United States. But though rich in resources, it is small in population. The shortage of labor means that wages are high. So industrialists look to new labor-saving machinery to reduce their costs and make up for what they call the want of hands. Machines now stamp and grind thousands of interchangeable parts faster and more cheaply than humans could ever do. Once independent workmen are now paid in wages to run machinery. Gatling thrives in this new American system. He designs a revolutionary planting machine called the seed drill. It dramatically increases agricultural yields and makes Gatling a rich man. But industrial growth splits the country in two. In 1861, North and South go to war over what kind of country the United States will be, on whether Western expansion will be based on plantations and slaves or factories and wage labor. The war changes everything. Gatling is accused of being a Southern spy and with one of his cousins a Yankee prisoner of war, Gatling is a divided and unhappy man. I witnessed almost daily the return of the wounded, sick, and dead from the front. I thought if I could get up a gun with which one man could do the work of a hundred, that it might to a great extent supersede the necessity for large armies. If grain could be sown and reaped by machinery, then it might be possible to get up a machine gun to shoot by machinery. Gatling attaches six rifles to a circular frame. As he rotates the frame, the bolt of each rifle is forced to automatically load and fire. The faster the barrels whirl, the faster the bullets fly. Taking the hopper from his seed drill, Gatling creates a delivery system for the cartridges. Rather than deliver one seed at a time, the hopper now delivers one bullet at a time.
There were other machine guns that had uh, multiple barrels that were fired either sequentially or all at once. The Gatling gun was the first gun that had continuous fire by moving a crank and rotating the barrels. Machines were being applied to more and more aspects of production, if you will. And it was Gatling's genius to bring the gun into the machine age. Gatling pours his money into making his first 13 guns. But then in 1865, the South submits to the industrial might of the North and surrenders. Now Gatling has a gun, no war, and a mountain of debt. He manages to sell 100 guns to the US Army, but the one purchase is not enough. Gatling needs a much bigger market. And so he sails for Europe. A few of the guns he leaves behind are taken west by the army. With the South defeated, the Union is now free to expand. But the Plains Indians are blocking the way. At first, the value of the Gatling is not always understood. Colonel George Armstrong Custer, on his way to Little Bighorn, decides the heavy Gatlings will just slow his cavalry down. Up until the last 30 minutes of that battle, he thought he was going to win. He didn't just say, oh my god, there's 6,000 Indians down there. I made a big mistake. Had he had the Gatling guns, he probably would have won. Custer and 200 of his men die at Little Bighorn. One veteran of the Indian Wars learns the lesson. Arthur Howard, a Connecticut Yankee known as Gatling Howard, is obsessed by the unused potential of the gun and becomes its biggest promoter. But he is limited to shooting at wooden planks until a native rebellion erupts in Canada. In 1885, the mixed race Metis and Indians of the Red River Settlement, led by the charismatic Louis Riel, rebel against the Canadian government, who they claim has stolen their land and rights. The Canadians send an army of militia to the Northwest to destroy the Métis resistance. But everyone who fights in the West does so under the shadow of Custer's defeat. So the Canadians hire Gatling Howard, who brings three of his machine guns up to the Red River settlement. The Canadians attack Riel's headquarters at Batoche. The Métis, skilled fighters, charge the militia. They are on the verge of routing the government forces when Howard's Gatlings open fire. 51 Métis are killed at Batoche, and Riel is executed soon after. Now we have an instrument in which a tiny handful of men are capable of slaying thousands of the enemy. We have an instrument of colonial rule. The same industrial revolution driving the conquest of North America is also pushing the empires of Europe into the greatest land grab in history. It will be called the Scramble for Africa. Richard Jordan Gatling, now peddling his machine gun across Europe, hopes it will be the weapon the empires need. When Gatling goes to Europe after the Civil War, he would have found a Europe which had been vastly changed in one or two generations. Uh, using Karl Marx's phrase, uh, all that was solid turned into air. It was in fact a modern Europe that he went to, brought on by industrial technology social and material changes undreamed of. The 
greatest of the European powers is Britain, and it is always hungry for more raw materials and markets for its imperial growth. In 1867, the year Gatling arrives in Europe, the first South African diamond is discovered by a shepherd boy. That same year, American Henry Morton Stanley calls for Christianity and commerce to be brought to the Dark Continent. Africa has cotton for textiles, oil to fuel the new machines, gold and now diamonds to replenish European war chests. The riches of Africa are on everyone's minds. Gatling gets permission to demonstrate his weapon at the army testing grounds at Shoebriness outside London. The gun he has brought misfires, and a strong wind makes it inaccurate. But to his great relief, the British are impressed enough to order Gatlings for their arsenal. The machine gun was the single most important um, element in the armory of the imperial powers that distinguished them from the the people that they were subjecting. The fringes of Africa had been within the orbit of European power since the 16th century, but that was a very thin membrane of control that reached not much farther inland than ships of the line could shoot. The new industrial technologies made it possible to penetrate the interiors passed to the very heart of darkness. The new steam-powered riverboats can now take British and other great powers into the center of Africa. Quinine protects them from malaria. But the massive numbers of native armies still offset the power of the latest breech-loading rifles. The image of Africa certainly shouldn't be of people who were totally disorganized or didn't have any type of government system, didn't have any type of economic system or social system. You had paved cities, you had libraries, trade. The societies were developed and organized. One of the most powerful of all the African nations is the Zulu Kingdom. In the early 19th century, it had conquered an enormous territory in southern Africa. Its king, Chetswayo, commands an army of 60,000 highly disciplined warriors. Now the Zulus stand between Britain and the gold, diamonds, and rich grazing lands of the interior. In January 1879, British General Lord Frederick Chelmsford leads an army into the heart of Zululand. Chetswayo addresses his warriors. I am sending you out against the whites who have invaded Zululand and driven away our cattle. You will attack by daylight, as there are enough of you to eat them up. Chelmsford sets up camp below a flat-topped mountain called Isandlwana. He then splits his force, chasing a small group of Zulus who lure him behind the mountain. While Chelmsford is gone, the main British force is attacked by Chetswayo's army. He would outflank his enemies on the sides and then surround them from the back so that they would no longer have the option of retreating. And then he would attack and destroy. The British desperately form three tiers with their rifles, one line firing, one aiming, one loading. But the volleys are not enough to stop the Zulus. Chelmsford returns to find his army slaughtered fewer than 60 soldiers survive. Unlike George Custer, Chelmsford has another chance. He makes a second expedition into Zululand, and this time he brings two Gatlings. Chetswayo sends an envoy to sue for peace, which is ignored. Chelmsford sets up a square on the plain in front of the Zulu capital, Ulundi. The Zulus charge. The two Gatlings face out from the front of the square. The operators turn the Gatling's cranks. In a few hours, the Zulu army has ceased to exist.
Chetswayo is kept in a dungeon before he is taken to London, where he has tea with Queen Victoria. With their kingdom destroyed, the Zulu become landless laborers, and southern Africa falls to the British. There are not tears enough to grieve for all our dead. Control of raw materials is what it's about. Land ownership is the source of wealth. And when you think of the enormous resources, the copper belt in, in Africa and the mines in South Africa, they're tremendously valuable. The Third World was vital and became even more vital, especially when the internal combustion engine was invented, because the internal combustion engine depends on not only petrol, but above all rubber. In 1888, the bicycle tire adds to this demand for rubber. Belgium uses machine guns to grab the rubber-producing Congo. King Leopold has his troops shoot rubber tappers who work too slowly. Their right hands are cut off as proof that each bullet has been well used. Making a grab for the diamonds of southern Africa, the British give the adventurer, Cecil John Rhodes, troops and machine guns to destroy the Matabele nation. An old man of 74 described the circumstances under which Cecil Rhodes invaded Matabele land in the 1890s. And at one point in his account, he said, and the white men came with their gun. Boom, 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 He went on for about 15 seconds, then he paused and went on again, boom, 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 and he was describing a machine gun. It was a very vivid example of the power of the machine gun for colonial expansion. Richard Jordan Gatling lives out most of his life in Hartford, Connecticut. He becomes editor of the Scientific American and goes on to invent a motorized plow and a flush toilet. Just before his death in 1903, he says he would prefer to be remembered for his plow. But on every continent, the word Gatling means only one thing. With the help of the machine gun, Russia takes the Caucasus, Siberia, and Central Asia. The United States uses it to seize Cuba from Spain and to conquer the Philippines. Britain takes North India, Burma, and Tibet. Wherever it goes, the machine gun ends all resistance to colonial expansion. At the turn of the century, the division of the world is virtually complete. The ever-expanding empires of Europe have nowhere else to go. For the empires of Europe, the division of the world is almost a family affair. Queen Victoria's son will soon rule the British Empire as Edward VII. Her son-in-law, Nicholas, is to be the Tsar of Russia. And her grandson, Willy, will be Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. But as the 19th century draws to a close, this family unity is in trouble. The empires are in conflict over colonial possessions, market domination, and trade. As they run out of room, the empires grind against each other like tectonic plates, and they begin to shop for the newest and deadliest weapons. It was not well understood how all of the new technologies, naval as well as land base, would be used, which would prove decisive so prudence dictated stocking up on all of them. In 1880, a brilliant Yankee inventor, Hiram Maxim, arrives in London. At age 40, he already has 50 patents under his belt. A bitter rival of Thomas Edison, Maxim has been paid $20,000 a year to leave the United States and abandon his work on the electric light. In London, he is soon bored, until he meets an old friend from the U.S. 
He said to me, hang your chemistry and electricity. If you want to make a pile of money, invent something to help these Europeans cut each other's throats with greater facility. Backed by Albert Vickers, the British steelmaker, Maxim sets up a small workshop and begins to experiment with a new kind of gun, a gun that will power itself. He uses the explosion of the cartridge to load and fire the next bullet. Gatling's gun needed a man to turn the crank. All Hiram Maxim's gun needs is a finger on the trigger. The Maxim gun made the hand-operated guns obsolete. The cyclic rate of the, of the Maxim was around 550. It would take several hundred infantry soldiers to duplicate that rate of fire in one minute. The Maxim gun fires so quickly that the barrel needs a jacket of water to keep it from melting. It is the world's first truly automatic weapon. Maxim calls it my little gun. Maxim's workshop in Hatton Gardens becomes a place of pilgrimage, where important men like Edward, the Prince of Wales, come to witness the power of the gun. In Vienna, in front of the Austrian Emperor Franz Joseph, Maxim demonstrates his gun, firing at eight rounds a second. At first, the demonstration is perfect. Maxim even carves out the Emperor's initials in bullet holes. Suddenly, the gun jams. Maxim is perplexed. He discovers that it has been sabotaged. The culprit is a mysterious Greek gentleman named Basil Zaharoff. Zaharoff is selling an inferior hand-cranked machine gun, the Nordenfeld, one of the many arms he has peddled. Soon, he will be known as the greatest arms dealer in history. Zaharoff made his first business contacts as a youth when he pimped for brothels in Constantinople. Now he is rich, fluent in nine languages, and welcome in the royal courts of Europe. Sir Basil Zaharoff, the merchant of death. There is something terribly honest about him. Uh, you know, we, we have characters today that are, that are terrible, that represent them the way we are, but they're somehow craven, and, and some, somehow Zaharoff wasn't. There was something grand about Zaharoff. One glance at Maxim's gun has convinced Zaharoff that it is a far superior weapon to the one he is selling. He drops the Nordenfeld and becomes the exclusive agent for Maxim's gun. This is good news for Maxim. In the years which follow, Zaharoff demonstrates his expertise at exploiting the rivalries between European powers. He sold the Turks the submarine, and, and the Greeks are horrified that this he'd gone and sold the Turks the submarine. And, and he said, there's only one thing that can counter the Turkish submarine, and that is the Greek submarine. Zaharoff visits Germany, which is rapidly becoming the industrial power to reckon with in Europe. Now, under license, Germany will produce thousands of Maxim guns. After the sale in Germany, Zaharoff buys into a Paris newspaper and plants stories of German armaments that frighten the French into buying more weapons from him. In 1897, Maxim and Zaharoff merge their company with industrialist turned arms manufacturer Albert Vickers, who lends his name to the British version of the gun. It is the British who give the Vickers Maxim its first major battle test, 3,000 miles away on the hot desert plains of North Africa. In 1898, the British and the French are in a race to see who will control the Sudan. Major General Sir Herbert Kitchener has been dispatched up the Nile River with five gunboats, 15,000 men, and 27 Maxim guns. There wasn't that much going in the Sudan by itself, but it was in conjunction with Egypt. And Egyptian cotton was of very substantial interest to the world market. To secure the Sudan, the British have to first defeat the massive army of the Sudan's dervish ruler, the Caliph Abdullah. Outside the Sudanese capital of Omdurman, 
Kitchener's soldiers confront the dervishes, who outnumber them four to one. The British army forms into its ruler-straight battle lines. A 24-year-old British officer rides out to witness his first real battle. His name is Winston Churchill. He watches the dervishes charge, and the maxims on the gunboats open fire. A terrible machine, the beautiful white devil wreathed itself in smoke. The charging dervishes sank down in tangled heaps. The great dervish army that advanced at sunrise fled in utter rout, leaving more than 9,000 warriors dead. Thus ended the Battle of Omdurman, the most single triumph ever gained by the arms of science over barbarians. The essence of this military superiority was encapsulated in the famous um, verse, fortunately we have got the Maxim gun and they have not. And this was made us all feel very secure and complacent. I mean, they were heathen, weren't they? The easy triumph at Omdurman wins the Nile for the British and a knighthood for Sir Hiram Maxim. The French give up their claims over the Sudan and Britain and France divide North Africa between them. The old imperial enemies are forced to become friends to deal with a new threat, Germany. Left out of the scramble for colonies, Kaiser Wilhelm's Germany will no longer be contained by its borders. Its population has overtaken Britain's, and it produces more steel and more arms. Now the Kaiser is building a fleet of dreadnoughts, challenging Britain's mastery of the oceans. Europe bristles with the machine guns that Sir Basil Zaharoff has sold to both sides. And nobody foresees what the result will be until 1914. When used by Western powers against each other, they suddenly got a taste of, of what they'd been doing to the Fuzzy Wuzzies. And uh, it was horrendous because it was on a far huger scale, of course. August 3rd, 1914, the war Europe has been expecting begins. A great feeling of relief swept across Europe. At last, we don't know how to keep the peace. We've come very close on numerous occasions in the last few years. Now we can fight a war and we know how to do that. Within a month, six empires sent five million troops on the march. Almost everyone expects a short war, with decisive battles won by glorious cavalry charges. But this war will be different. This time, machine guns face machine guns. Yes, I was quite proud of being a Maxim gunner. I felt it was quite a specialist job, the way. You mounted the gun on the parapet with a tripod, you know, and set the sights right, put a belt in, and then, just as it was getting dusk, press the button. Brrrr, spray the whole of the German front line with the 250 rounds. To escape the fire of each other's heavy machine guns, both sides dig in and spread out. Soon they run out of space, and trench confronts trench in a 400-mile-long scar stretching from the English Channel to the Alps. It was about that speed. The hail of metal put out by the Maxims makes the dead zone between the two lines impossible to cross. The gun is soon nicknamed the Queen of No Man's Land. You felt that you were, you were something that mattered. Very much so. You were a power. 
after you were on top of the Germans uh, for the time being. You'd see the dirt fly up over the German front line. Whether I'd hit him or killed anybody, I don't know. Now what happens is you don't have to look at a particular individual and say, I am going to kill him. You don't have to point your rifle at one individual, draw a bead, pull the trigger. Now you can just kind of hose indiscriminately in an area and have less of a sense of individual accountability. So this dynamic of killing from long range becomes possible. I don't think the Germans filled me with a burning desire to kill them. To stop them, yes, that's all right, but wound them. But I was never one that had it in my back of my mind that I wanted to kill. I suppose that was because of my bringing up. Despite the stalemate, the generals have to attack to win the war. The only solution they can think of is to order the men out of the trenches in a frontal assault. July 1916. The Allies have picked the Somme to launch their big push to break through the German lines. It is the greatest military operation in history. They count on a massive seven-day artillery barrage to eliminate the machine guns and make no man's land safe for the infantry to cross. At 7.30 a.m., the artillery stops firing. Norman Edwards and 100,000 Allied troops go over the top and begin their walk across no man's land. I can see the place now. But the Germans have survived the bombardment by digging deep underground. A thousand Maxim crews now drag their heavy guns into position. The men begin to tuck their chins into their shoulders as if they are walking into a storm of hail. He's advancing step, step, step. He's in this perseverance mode. He's horrified. He's overwhelmed. All he can do is just perform that same action. And all you see is the muzzle flash. There was a bullet every yard. They had what they called the tap. And they tapped the guns to move them. And they weren't even looking at what they were shooting at. They were probably playing cards and just tapping this gun that was water cool, that was firing all day and just mowing down thousands of people. It needed a very brave man to keep on attacking the machine gun firing at him. <sighs> Almost 20,000 British soldiers die on that first day most of them from machine gun bullets. When the Somme campaign finally grinds to a halt four months later in the mud of November, the casualties on both sides number about a million and a half. After 60 days of continuous combat, 98% of all soldiers who had not previously become a casualty, after 60 days, 98% will have become psychiatric casualties. The horror of standing up with 500 men and then staggering back to the trenches five minutes later with 50 men. The machine gun made mass killing possible, and it also made mass psychological casualties possible. The luck, when you think that that bullet there, it only, only had to be six inches more there. I should be under the ground, I know. <laughs> Just ten days after the Somme campaign is called off, Sir Hiram Maxim dies in London. 
His little gun is well on its way to killing more British subjects than any weapon in history. To break the deadlock it has created, the machine gun will spawn radical new 20th century technologies. They cannot come too soon for the men trapped in their trenches. The protracted deadlock at the front brings the war home. Entire populations are now caught up as workers and the home front become as important as the armies. It takes 10,000 workers a month to make enough shells for one day's heavy bombardment. Henry Ford first develops his assembly line in 1913 right on the eve of war. But it's immediately useful in turning out the enormous quantities of material, of artillery shells and machine guns. Mass production really comes of age. 800,000 women recruited into munitions work in Britain. It was even said at the time that, that the Great War was won in the machine shops and factories. It is mass war. To justify the levels of sacrifice, propaganda has to demonize the enemy and make the war seem like a final battle between good and evil. The goal is nothing less than annihilation of the enemy. The scale, not merely of the mobilization, uh, the economic mobilization, the military mobilization, and the sheer destruction, uh, more or less, undermined everything that had previously been regarded as, you might say, the rules of the game. All the shells are made, and all the shells rain down, and all the while men continue to go over the top. The old soldierly virtues of skill in combat, strength and courage count for little when confronted by machine guns and artillery. The methods of trench warfare, the intense artillery fire and the machine gun, you know, caused the death of God. You couldn't conceive of God within the hell of trench warfare. You might be able to conceive of the devil, but you couldn't conceive of God. And then, of course, we need God, so God had to come back, and maybe God came back in the form of the airplane. In the first weeks of the war, airplanes are used only for reconnaissance, and enemy flyers wave at each other. Then they start to throw bricks and darts. Well, the air war was fought by individuals who were very young, very romantic, and who were extraordinarily courageous. Uh, they weren't allowed parachutes because the air staff uh, believed that if, that if people had parachutes, they would be more reluctant to engage the enemy, um, an extraordinarily, loathsomely obtuse attitude. They're almost certain to burn to death if their aircraft caught fire. One of the first to shoot in the air is the daredevil Frenchman Roland Garros. I flew up close to a German aviatique. The pilot and his observer waved. Then I took out my revolver and squeezed the trigger six times. I missed all six shots. The Germans were too shocked at my breach of etiquette to react, so I waved and flew away. The machine gun was the only way that you were likely to hit something else that was moving at 80 to 120 miles an hour. They couldn't use them um, until they had a synchronizing mechanism through their own propellers. Although some of them used to mount them on the aircraft and deliberately do sort of one-shot exercise and fire through their own propellers, shatter the propellers, and then try and glide back. It is the French who invent the first synchronizing device that links the engine and the machine gun. But it doesn't always work. So Garros nails steel plates to his prop and takes off anyway. 
Then, engine trouble forces him down behind enemy lines. Garrus escapes, but his synchronizer falls into German hands. Their brilliant engineer, Anton Fulker, perfects the device. Now, pilots can attack without fear of shooting their propellers off. Out of this marriage of the airplane and the machine gun, the fighter is born. Duels in the air, or dogfights as they are soon called, begin. And a new kind of warrior appears, the ace. Men like Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, and Canadian air ace Billy Bishop become international heroes competing over the number of kills. But stardom comes at a high price. Average life expectancy of a combat pilot on the Western Front is as low as six weeks. Garros lasts six months before he burns to death in his plane. As the aces fight for supremacy over France, British civilians for the first time in history come under direct enemy attack from German airships. The Zeppelins fly too high for the fighters laden with their heavy Maxims to reach. But an American inventor, Isaac Newton Lewis, creates an air-cooled machine gun powered by its own explosive gases rather than the heavy recoil springs. Mounted on high-flying aircraft and firing incendiary bullets, the Lewis gun is sent into battle against the Zeppelins. History's first long-distance bombers are destroyed. But the victories in the air cannot break the deadlock on the ground. As a young man, Winston Churchill had seen how devastating the machine gun could be. Now as a cabinet minister, he champions the radical invention that may finally challenge its deadly power. In March of 1918, the German army launches its spring offensive. They attack with a new kind of unit, the stormtroopers. They use faster, looser tactics, and they carry a new kind of weapon, the MP-18, the world's first submachine gun. Sacrificing long-range accuracy for portability, the MP-18 can be handled easily by a man on the run. In a few hours, the Germans punch through Allied lines. It almost wins them the war. But the crucial battles of 1918 would be won by another child of the machine gun. August 8th, German troops see an utterly terrifying form rumbling slowly out of the smoke. Protected from machine gun fire by a coating of armor, this land battleship is known by its code name, the tank. Churchill has campaigned for years to get the army to adopt the tank. Now they are being used effectively for the first time. They punch through German lines, gaining more ground in hours than the Allies won in three years of deadlock. The tank came as a response, forced on tactics by machine guns. But by the time it did, the Western Front was in such a mess that the, the tanks, even the tanks, could barely operate. On their own, neither the tank nor the submachine gun can win this war. The Great War, which began with the mechanical rattle of machine guns, ends with the whimper of an exhausted Europe. In 1918, US troops arrive to reinforce the defeated allies. In Germany, inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution, half-starved troops mutiny and take over garrisons, ships, and factories. The Kaiser turns his Maxim guns against his own people to save his empire and the war. In the end, he loses both. He is deposed on November 9th, and two days later, Germany signs an armistice. Four empires, the German, Austro-Hungarian, Russian, and Ottoman, have been destroyed by the Great War. 
nine million soldiers and six million civilians have perished. With them have died the optimism and faith of the late 19th century. They didn't even believe anything after 1918 was peace. As it, you know, peace when they said uh, in peacetime, what they meant is before the First World War. Because li life, all life has changed. This was actually the breakdown of the entire 19th century civilization, bourgeois, capitalist, liberal, because of the nature of the First World War. He is 85-year-old, Sir Basil Zaharoff. Basil Zaharoff moves to Monaco, where he buys the casino and lives out the rest of his days in secluded luxury. With weapons of destruction. He is estimated to have made six dollars for every man killed in the war. One of the richest men in the world. Born as a tool of empire, the machine gun has destroyed the empires it helped to build and paved the way for a new great power. The 20th century will belong to the country that invented the machine gun, the United States of America. Europe struggles to recover but the United States is in a boom. It has bankrolled the war, and now the whole world owes it money. But a future so filled with promise will soon turn to economic chaos, and the war to end all wars will be followed by another world war with even deadlier machine guns.